Yeah, thank, you. thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, welcome to the uh, afternoon session of the uh, Maximin Conference. It's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Egan uh, Schulte, who will talk about skeletal polyhedra complexes and symmetry. Uh, over to you, Egan. Thanks very much, Vitaly, uh, also for the uh, uh, nice introduction and for the invitation in the first place. Um, so I'd like to talk about um, an old subject. Um, uh, about geometry that goes back to, uh, to the ancient times. And um, many of you actually have, um, or some of you actually have, might have seen some of the slides and uh, sort of have, have seen parts of the presentation, but I think most of you have not. So um, I'd like to talk about polyhedra, a very old subject going back to the Greeks. And if you look at, uh, over the history, you will see there have been many changes in point of view about these polyhedra. And so for example, everything that you see at the bottom is actually, uh, uh, has lots of characteristic of a polyhedron. So from the left to the right, the icosahedron, one of the kepler poinceau polyhedra and so on. And I want to argue and explain why they are considered uh, polyhedra. So let's start slowly. Um, everyone is familiar with the platonic solids and traditionally or historically, the point of view was that of a solid and convexity played a big role. And if one goes down the symmetry hierarchy, then you meet the Archimedean solids and the prisms and anti-prisms. They are not quite as symmetric as the platonic solids, but they, they, they are, again, they are, they, the point of view here is that of a solid. And that uh, concept of a polyhedron started to change with the kepler poinceau polyhedra. Um, now, what is new here? Why are they polyhedra? The, the focus is no longer on, on solids as in the, in the classic or in the platonic case, but even though you can uh, view these polyhedra as that you are seeing here as solids, the solid representation is not actually representative of the combinatorial structure of the uh, kepler poinceau polyhedra. Here in this case, you have to allow faces and vertex links or vertex figures that are star polygons. So for example, here on the very left, you, you see one of the kepler poinceau polyhedra and its faces uh, are pentagrams. It's sort of the, the light pentagram that you are seeing here. And uh, in the early, or in, in about 19, in the 1930s, uh, there was again a generalization of the concept of the, uh, of the uh, polyhedron that is connected to the petri coxetic polyhedron. Everyone has seen these pictures. Um, <clears throat> so what's different here? Um, first of all, the inf oh. Oops, excuse me one second. Uh, uh, I'm the trouble is I'm chair of the department and <laughs> they don't expect me to speak at all. Um, okay, no so, problem. <laughs> um, so here are the Petri Coxeter polyhedra, and the faces are again convex polygons, but now the vertex figure, the way they are, um, the way the, the faces meet at a vertex is that of a skew arrangement. And so, what is a vertex figure of a vertex? A vertex figure of a vertex, like the one that I'm pointing to here, is, uh, is a polygon. And that connects the neighbors of the vertices in the same way in which uh, um, they occur around the vertex. So for example, here, I take the neighbors of the four vertices and join them up in the order in which they occur. And I show that more explicitly maybe here in a picture of that is shown here. In, you see here the, the reddish um, polygon that's actually a skew polygon. It's not, it doesn't lie in the plane. And the central vertex, so to speak, is a vertex of the original polyhedra. So that's the notion of a vertex figure of a polyhedra. And that will be uh, coming up often. And um, <clears throat> so that's a little bit about the historical background. And then in the 1970s, uh, Branko Grunbaum initiated uh, a new approach to polyhedra, namely that 
concerning skeletal polyhedra. And that's, in essence, it's a graph theoretical approach. And um, the faces and vertex figures are allowed to be skewed, to be skewed, no longer planar. So for example, the faces are actually cycles of edges. So there is no, for example, there is no con a convex polygon you would not consider as a topological disk. You would just look at the, the edge cycles of the boundary paths. And so once you throw away all the uh, sort of two-dimensional topology that may be there, um, you actually get this concept of a skeletal polyhedron. So the faces are, um, are cycles or they could be infinite paths as well. And then there's in, uh, the natural question, what are the most symmetric skeletal polyhedra? And the answer is, the so-called regular skeletal polyhedra, and I will discuss them. And, um, and we will see that this, this skewness of the faces that might uh, look initially uh, uh, artificial to you is actually not at all artificial. And it very, lines up very naturally with the group theory that is behind this. So let me give you a formal definition that uh, what a skeletal polyhedron is. So a skeletal polyhedron P in E3 is a finite or infinite family of simple polygons called the faces. So polygons mean one dimensional cycles or infinite paths. And the condition is each edge of a face is an edge of just one other face. So it's a very familiar condition from convex polyhedron. Then all faces incident with the vertex form one circuit. So there's nat a natural way to go around the uh, uh, vertex, so to speak. And the whole object is connected, which essentially means in this context here that uh, the edge graph is connected. And we are also interested in uh, restricting ourselves to um, discrete objects. That means we want the property that every compact set meets only finitely many objects. So it can't happen that there are infinitely, infinitely many edges uh, meeting at a vertex, for example. So all the traditional polyhedra are polyhedra in this sense. And um, in other words, we have to look at additional polyhedra which have these properties. And let me uh, introduce a few of them. Um, so my first example is that of the Petri dual of the cube. And what is a Petri dual of the cube? The Petri, the, it is obtained from the original cube by throwing out the square faces, but keeping the vertices and the edges, and then inserting into this vertex edge structure, new faces. And the new faces are now the Petri polygons of the cube. And by a Petri polygon, I mean a zigzag along uh, the edges of the cube. So for example, let me trace the red one, right? So it's a hexagonal zigzag on the boundary of the cube. And they close up, so, so there are exactly four of these zigzag, uh, zigzags on the cube, and they form a new polyhedron, a new skeletal polyhedron, and that's called a Petri dual or petriel of the cube. So the question is then, uh, how can we enumerate all the, uh, the skeletal regular polyhedra? And so we already said that the faces can be uh, very general. They can be, they, they can be flat or skew, or they can even be infinite uh, and helical or zigzag faces. So here you see a collection of polygons at the bottom, at, on the left, a convex pond, a convex polygon, then star polygon, a more complicated star polygon. And uh, then in the middle, you see the zigzag, right? A planar zigzag. And uh, then as you go to the right, you would meet a skew polygon. Uh, and the, the red hexagons are just there for reference to be able to draw it better. And this is a skew hex, uh, no, it would be a skew, what, 12 graph. And an even more complicated 
figure to the right of it, uh, which uses octagons, but in, a, in an even more skewed fashion, so to speak, um, sort of a star polygon-like fashion. And on the very left, on the very right, I'm sorry, you see a helical polygon lying on its side, right, rather than vertical. So all these things are potentially candidates for faces. And um, so what then, uh, what are the objects we should uh, look for? Um, so there's the first is so-called regular skeletal polyhedron. So what, uh, what are these objects? So P is called, a, is regular. So P again is skeletal polyhedron. If the symmetry group G of P is transitive on the flags. And by a flag, I mean an incident triple consisting of a vertex, an edge, and a face. So that means a flag has a vertex and an edge that contains a vertex and a face that contains the vertex and the edge. So this is the most symmetry you can have in a polyhedron, namely that the symmetry group is acting transitively on the flag. If you go a little further down, then you get what is called a chiral polyhedron. And a chiral polyhedron has two orbits on the flags. But we want adjacent or flags to be in the same, in different orbits all the time. So what that means is it is sort of introduces a combinatorial sense of left and right handedness. But at the same time, you have sort of maximal symmetry while having chirality. Yeah? So it's chirality in the presence of uh, uh, maximal symmetry, but it's a combinatorialized common, uh, uh, chirality. And if you go further down in the, in the hierarchy, symmetry hierarchy, you could aim for a, for a classification of the Archimedean uh, uh, solids, uh, or a skeletal polyhedron rather. And what are Archimedean polyhedra? They are, have a vertex transitive symmetry group. So G of P is vertex transitive. And P has regular polygons as faces. So polygons that of the kinds that I mentioned at the top of this page, right? So that's an Archimedean um, solid. So let me stretch a little bit the, uh, uh, what, uh, sort of what one could think of, uh, or actually turns out to be a skeletal polyhedron. Although there is really not yet any three-dimensionality in it. It's sort of a combinatorialized uh, rank, uh, namely three. So that's a Petri dual of the square tessellation. Um, so here we have a square tessellation uh, in, in the plane and I'm throwing out all the squares, but I'm keeping all the vertices and the the edges, and in and then I'm introducing new faces, and these are these zigzags that I'm showing here, right? So uh, they're characterized by the property that any two consecutive edges, but no three, lie in a common square face of the original tiling. So if I take the vertices and edges of all of the square tiling and together with all these so-called Petri polygons, then I'm getting a skeletal polyhedra, but it happens to be a planar skeletal polyhedra. And the, the type is infinity four, and the type of a polyhedron uh, it typically has two symbols. The first tells you the type of the, of the face. Uh, that means we have infinitely many vertices, so that's infinity. Uh, zigzag in this case, and four of them meet at each vertex. So the last number tells you the number of faces that meet at each vertex. So let me also show you an example of a polyhedron that has helical faces. And um, I, I guess this, uh, many of you will know this structure in, in maybe in, in a different context. Uh, so let me quickly describe how you get this structure. Um, so here, this is a polyhedron that has, well, that has helical faces that are sort of spiraling over a square. And three of these helical faces meet at G's vertex. So it's constructed as follows. <clears throat> we have the 
start from the square tessellation of the plane that this on the, I'm looking at the left picture and the, the black dots you see at the bottom, so to speak, these are the vertices of a square tessellation. And over one quarter of these squares, you erect towers, these cubical towers, two-sided infinite going up and down. And these things are just there, these towers are just there for reference so that I can describe this structure better. They're not actually part of the structure. Um, <clears throat> And now in e or for each of these vertical towers, you, you look at a helix, a helical polygon that winds up one step at a time. So go, going from one store, uh, one floor to the next floor. And after four steps, you are back above the original vertex, but four steps up. And if you keep doing this, you, you create these helices that are sort of running on the outside of these towers. And what you want to do is you want to shift these helices relative to each other so that there are actually this, these bridges that I've indicated, right? So these thin bridges so that you can actually walk from one tower to, to the adjacent tower, so to speak. And um, so what we have created so far is the complete vertex set and also the complete edge set of the structure. But these vertical helices are actually only one third of the, um, of the faces, the helical faces. There are two more sets of helical faces that are, um, that are constructed in exactly the same way as the um, the vertical ones. Now, these two sets, so the first set goes from the front to the back, um, and it's indicated here on the right with these red, polygon, uh, re red helical polygons, right? So we have a complete set of, of helices going from the front to the back, and we also have an, a second complete set of helices going from the uh, left to the right. These are these green helices. And um, so they are using the edges that are already there, but uh, they are different from the original blue helices. So altogether, this gives, gives you a really nice structure with helical faces. And uh, that's a skeletal polyhedron in our sense. So here you see another example. Here on the right, you would see a, a view from the, um, uh, from the top down, from So how many uh, regular polyhedra are there? Um, so it turns out, uh, so the, the, it turns out there are exactly 48 regular polyhedra and I always refer to them as a Grunbaum dress polyhedra. Uh, Grunbaum just uh, introduced this concept in the 1970s and he actually found all but one of these polyhedra and Andreas Dress in the uh, around 1980 actually um, found the last one and proved completeness. And the, 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 a new proof, there are new proofs or new approaches to this polyhedron that was done with uh, Peter McMullen uh, uh, several years ago. And um, so I'm following this approach. And so the, the first observation that, that you would have to make is that the symmetry group of these polyhedra is, is always generated by reflections. And these are no longer reflections in planes as we are used to from the platonic solids. They are reflections in points. Uh, they are reflection in lines, that means half, half turns, or they are reflection in planes. And it turns out that the classification of these regular polyhedra is very closely related to uh, the classification of these triples of reflections that, that can show up. So let me tell you then what the, what the answer is to, uh, to the full classification. So there, it turns out there are um, 18 finite polyhedra and these are the platonic solids and the four cap, and here we see them, the platonic solids, but also their petrials, their petri duals, right? They constructed in the manner I described for the, for the cube. And 
And there are also the Petri Coxeter polyhedra, uh, yeah, uh, not Petri Coxeter, the Kepler Ponceau polyhedra, and their petrials. So the petrials in that case are a little more complicated, but, but they are there and constitute together with the, uh, with the um, Kepler Ponceau, the remaining finite polyhedra. And they can all be tabulated nice, nicely in a, in, in a diagram, and there are ways of actually getting from one to the other by either duality or by PT operations. And there are other inter operations that, uh, that are also relevant, but um, so that's a very nice display of all the 18 ones. And then we get to the infinite polyhedra or a pyrohedra. And it turns out there are exactly six planar ones. And, and they, they are, uh, first of all, the three familiar regular tessellations by triangles, squares, and hexagons, but also their petri duals. And so the petri duel that I showed before, that's, uh, that's here shown again, that's one of these six regular, uh, six planar regular skeletal polyhedra. Then it gets more interesting. Um, there are 12 so-called blended polyhedra or reducible polyhedra, and they are um, obtained as blends from a planar object and a linear object. And so they, they fall into uh, two groups of six. And the first is con uh, contains the blends of a planar polyhedron with a line segment. And if you look here at the blue structure, you, you would notice that if you project it down, you would recover a, the square tessellation that is shown here at the bottom, the black square tessellation. If you, so that's a regular, a planar regular polyhedron. If you project the entire structure on a vertical direction, then you would, get a line segment. So in other words, these structures project down onto something two-dimensional as indicated here or and something linear. And in this case, you can see how they are built. Uh, and, and this one is built on, on top of the square tessellation, so to speak. You take two copies of the square tessellation, which are parallel, and uh, over each square, you build a new square, which now is a skew square or, or tetragon, as I often call it. And that's built in the manner. So for example, here on the very left, if you take this bottom square on the very left, you get the very left blue object. So you, you start at the bottom, then you go up to the adjacent vertex uh, in the second layer on the right, so to speak, and so on. So you cycle around once. And then you do that over every square and it closes up nicely. And it's one of the six planar uh, regular polyhedra um, that is a blend uh, of a, no, it's one of the, uh, pla of the skeletal uh, polyhedra that's a blend of a planar polyhedra and a line segment. And you can actually change the uh, relative ratios to each other, right? So the, the two layer square test two layers of square tessellation can be changed relative to each other. So there is a, a, a degree of freedom here in this particular construction. Similarly here, um, we also have six uh, blends of a planar tessellation and uh, of a planar object and a line object. So a one-dimensional object, really, an infinite one-dimensional object. And so how do, they, do you get those? It's indicated here, you have four columns. So again, this is sort of built on top of a square tessellation of a plane, and I'm only showing square, um, uh, sort of four squares at the bottom. And um, again, over each square of a uh, planar tessellation, you build an infinite tower, uh, two-sided going up and down, and you use these towers to define the polyhedron and these, uh, this polyhedron has helical faces and they wind around these towers, like the red one, for example, is one of the helix. It says then uh, 
the orange one, I think, and the green one and the blue one. And they together, uh, if you do this over all squares uh, of the square tessellation, then you actually create an, an object that has a property that when you project it down from the top, you create a square tessellation of the plane, right? So uh, the two-dimensional component is a square tessellation. And if you project it uh, to a vertical direction, then you see you would get a line tessellation, a tessellation of the line by intervals. And so there are altogether six such objects which are obtained from the six planar the skeletal polyhedra. And um, yeah, so uh, this is the second class. And then it gets quite complicated, actually. And there are 12 uh, so-called pure polyhedra or um, irreducible polyhedra or, or a pyrohedra, which are, um, cannot be obtained by any blending or, or anything of that sort. So they have their own individuality, I want to say, but they are closely related to each other. And here, this picture shows you certain Schläfli symbols that represent the polyhedra. And let me point out at the top, for example, the two entries in the middle, they are actually two of the um, uh, Petri Coxeter, um, yeah, Petri Coxeter polyhedra. And uh, there's also one at the bottom here, 663, that's also a Petri Coxeter polyhedra. And um, they're closely related to each other with very nice operations that can be performed at geometric levels in many cases, and also uh, in particular on the algebraic level between the groups that, that are here. So let me here show you rather some pictures and um, so here, for example, um, this is one of the, uh, this was one of the uh, Petri Coxeter polyhedra that I showed you initially. And you can see how uh, we get the Petri dual of, of that by taking helices that run on the, on the edge graph of this uh, original polyhedron, right? Like the green one here, the green helix. It's just the beginning of the helix, really, that runs on the edges and the yellow he helix and the, a red helix and the blue helix. So that's how we get these, uh, these structures. Um, uh, so the Petri dots. And here again are my, the helix face polyhedron that fits in. That was on this display as well as the object that was on the very right. And it also has a Petri dual, which again has um, helical faces. Maybe I should skip this in the interest of time. So it turns out that um, they're overall exactly 48 and they, they, they are pretty well understood now. There's a lot still to be discovered, I think. But so the, the classification breaks down in 18 finite ones, 30 infinite ones. And the 30 infinite ones into the planar ones and into 12, so six planar ones, 12 blended ones, and and 12 pure ones. So now, now let me talk about the chiral polyhedra. And again, this is a, uh, I should point out, this is a, a notion of chirality that's sort of in the presence of very high symmetry. And um, in a way, it's sort of a combinatorialized notion of chirality. Um, so let me uh, point out a, a characteristic. We want that the symmetry group has two orbits on the flags and the adjacent flags are in distinct orbits. And so what that would mean is we sort of have in, in a way maximal rotational symmetry but no reflexive symmetry, right? So the generators that I, I mentioned are not R1 and R2, um, they are no longer there. And, uh, but instead we have these operations that are indicated here. So again, I'm drawing it on the square tessellation uh, because uh, although the square tessellation is not chiral, but it's easier to draw them. So you see here that in a chiral polyhedron, we ca can no longer map these little, so to speak, red triangles to an adjacent triangle. Uh, these, uh, these little blue triangles to adjacent uh, blue triangles, but we can sort of go two steps around. 
So in other words, we have this rotation S1 uh, about a phase, and also we have a rotation S2 about a vertex of that phase. And it turns out we also have a half turn about uh, the center of the edge of, of that phase. So when I, when I use the term rotations here, we have to be careful. These are not necessarily um, uh, geometric rotations. These are actually, uh, these in, in, in the cases that actually exist, they're always rotatory reflections and uh, for S1 and S2. And that really makes it extremely interesting because that immediately introduces skew faces and skew vertex figures. And um, so that uh, accounts for a completely uh, different situation then because among the convex poly uh, and among the regular skeletal polygon, you can only have skew, one of the types can only be skew. Namely finite, uh, the faces or the vertex figures, they cannot both be skew. And, but by going to chirality, you actually uh, uh, can make that happen. And so let me very briefly um, uh, describe the classification and it breaks down into a classification of, so that it turns out they are really chiral polyhedra. That wasn't so clear at the beginning. And, but they all must be infinite. And uh, so the classification breaks down into two types, namely the polyhedra that have finite faces and polyhedra that have infinite faces. And um, it turns out that we have for each kind, that means for those with finite faces and also for those with infinite faces, we have three very large two param parameter families of chiral polyhedra that exist. And um, yeah, so let me uh, tell you a little bit about these and, um, and also show you pictures rather than uh, maybe talking about the, uh, the classification itself. And so here's an example. Um, and this is not the complete chiral polyhedron that I'm showing, it is just the neighborhood of a single vertex in that polyhedron. And the single vertex is a central black vertex. And as you see, um, this object is constructed from the cubical tessellation of the plane, so to speak, a, a cubical tessellation of space, right? So that's there sort of as a reference figure. And we are using, again, certain PT polygons of the cubes in that tessellation. And, and they are arranged in exact, uh, as you go about around this central vertex, they are arranged in the, in the manner uh, that is shown. So for example, you start with the, the, um, the blue hexagonal object, uh, the hexagonal face at the bottom yeah, to the right. And you see it has uh, two edges that, going, that are uh, emanating from the central vertex here. And one is in olive, is uh, no one one to the right, and that's shared by the olive hexagon that's sort of in the back, and one goes down, and that's shared by the red hexagon on the on the left, and and so as you keep going around the central vertex, you would see you you encounter exactly six of these skew hexagons, and they produce the local picture of a chiral polyhedron of type six six. And um, so that's a local picture of, of that polyhedron. And then it, that expands, the situation expands at every vertex throughout space, and that gives you one of, um, of a, a polyhedra in, in one particular polyhedra in, in an infinite class of polyhedra. This one can be drawn nicely on the cube, and, um, but not all can be uh, drawn. Let me give you another example. And, um, and now I'm again sort of in the background is a cubical tessellation of the space as, the, as a reference figure. Uh, and now again, the central vertex is a vertex of the object. But now I want to create six. And again, I'm just looking at the local configuration at one vertex. And now I'm uh, introducing six tetragons, so skew squares 
that meet at this central vertex, namely the, the blue tetragon here to the, in the front and the, is, a, is the first one, say, and then as you go to the right, you see the, um, the olive tetragon, and as you keep going, you, you hit the red tetragon, then you hit another blue tetragon, then a, an olive tetragon, and then a, a, a red tetragon, and then it closes up to the front. So in other words, this is of type six, uh, four six. The faces are, are, to, are squares, in this case, Q squares, and six meeting at every vertex. And, and so that's a situation that is occurring at every vertex. So as I said, there are um, three very large classes of, of these chiral polyhedra, and they're either of type 6-6, six, six, um, that was the first type that I mentioned, or of type 4-6, that that's, was an exa um, uh, the example that I, the second example that I showed falls into that category, and there are also objects of type six four, which I didn't show an example. And um, so we have each falls into a two parameter family, and actually in that family there are also two regular polyhedra. That's very interesting, and they occur when one of the types, that means vertex um, faces or vertex figures, actually becomes flat. So it's a, a very interesting situation. All others have really skew faces, skew vertices. So here's a nice picture uh, or photograph that was taken by uh, one of my former PhD students, uh, Danielle Pellisser. And, um, and that is, is, a, is an, uh, a model of the structure uh, that he, he built actually by hand and photographed on his lawn in Morelia in Mexico, I think. And, uh, and here's another view. So the first view, let me go back for a second, maybe not telling so much, and uh, it's more difficult to get into this, but there's a central sort of the central ball here, the, the white ball. Um, and, the, and that's surrounded by six of these um, tetragons in a nice way. And here you can see that it has a lot of, there's a lot of structure to it. You know, you, it may not be so visible in the first picture. And then there are also these three classes of helix faced uh, chiral polyhedra. And they, there's the first class here on the left of type infinity three. They are helices over triangles, right? I showed you this. This one example where we had helices sort of spiraling over squares, but the one here on the left has helices spiraling over triangles. And, but we also have an infinite class with helices over squares in the middle. And we also have, again, another class uh, with helices over triangles that's on the right. And in that particular class, four of the helices meet at each vertex. So again, we have this interesting phenomenon that in this class are also two regular polyhedra. And um, so one of them is actually finite. So that's a sort of a, a limiting case really, if you want. And the, the, the helices, uh, so to speak, collapse to, uh, uh, to, uh, to um, triangles or squares. Here's a picture of them. You see sort of the helix, if you look at the central triangle that is here, um, and is, that triangle really accounts for a helix that's sort of drilling down and of course going up as well in this direction. And so you have these helices all over the place. Again, Daniel Pellisser built those. They have nice, very nice features. Oh, here's another one that's from the third um, family. Well, here are a few remarkable facts. And um, <clears throat> I mean, it's true that among those uh, chiral polyhedra that have finite faces, uh, it is that, that any two are actually essentially uh, non-isomorphic as combinatorial objects. That's, that means they are very, very rich. There are many, many chiral polyhedra. That's what they said. And with different 
their combinatorial characteristics. And um, yeah, and we have interesting chirality. But I want to mention um, something else. I don't know, Vitali, how much time uh, do I still have? Uh, you you say five more minutes or? Yeah, yeah, good, good, good. Thank you, thanks, I appreciate it. Okay. Um, so then there is a general, a possible generalization. How about we allow more than two faces meeting at an edge, right? So here's an example um, where you can see there are more than two faces meeting uh, at an edge. So here we have four faces meeting at an edge. Um, so for example, if you take the edge here that goes to the right from uh, emanating from the central vertex, you see four hexagons meeting there. So that's a, a, an object that's called a, a poly, polygonal complex. And, um, and it turns out one can classify all these, all the so-called regular polygonal complexes. And that's, um, uh, it, it turns out they, they fall into two families. One uh, is sort of one class or one, the four, the four that I mentioned, no, the, there are two, classes. The first class has four polyhedra and they are related to four really rank four objects. And the other class has 21 polyhedra and um, uh, um, not polyhedra, complexes. And um, they need to be sort of uh, enumerated individually. So, and there are very nice connections with the theory of, uh, I see David, <laughs> um, uh, with a theory of nets and uh, crystal nets and, uh, and regular nets and, and quasi regular nets. And uh, so we have all to, we, we are able to um, have a very, uh, we have a very nice connection between these regular polygonal complexes in general. Um, and uh, there's David, I see him. <laughs> and, uh, and nets, let me sort of bring that up. Here's another example that sort of indicates how you could possibly get these kind of structures. Um, again, built on the cubical tessellation, but now in, in fact built on, on a tetrahedra inscribed in the, in the cubes of the te uh, cubical tessellation. And what you would do is you would take the PT polygons of all these tetrahedra. And so it gives you a very nice structure. And here I want to sort of show this connection also with nets. And let me sort of jump ahead quite a bit. Um, so what is a net, a, crisp, a regular net is, um, is a, th a three periodic uh, geometric graph in space. And um, we're interested in those that have a, a transitive, a vertex transitive a symmetry group. And in particular to those, uh, in those that have coordination figures at the vertices that are regular polygons and platonic solids. And we want the property that the vertex stabilizers, that means the side symmetry groups, contain, rotation, contain the rotation symmetry group of these coordination figures. And it turns out that there are exactly um, five regular maps. And uh, so they are very closely related to these regular polygonal complexes and, and occur there. And there's also a notion of a semi, a quasi regular maps map and uh, I mentioned here the work of, of O'Keefe, Hyde, David, Prosopio, Delgado, Friedrichs. And it turns out all the edge graphs of all regular polygonal complexes, which are not polyhedra, are actually regular or quasi-regular maps. And that's, but not everyone occurs actually. Um, so then how would we go from here? Classification of Archimedean skeletal polyhedra. And I think, it's time for me to stop. We actually have made a, a good progress on, on the Ahmadian classification, but uh, there's still a lot of room to go. But thanks very much, everyone, for listening. Thank you very much, Egan. Let us thank Egan. <clears throat> yeah, thank <clears throat> right. Uh, very good. Let me stop.